good morning, everyone in Vancouver. Uh, I'm Cesar Victora, speaking from Brazil. And even though I cannot join you virtually uh, in, in presence, I will do so virtually. Many thanks for uh, the invitation that I originally received from John Chalice. It's a great place, uh, pleasure to be here in this session with Janet, James, and Vikram. Uh, let me move straight into my slides and my presentation. They are based on a series we have published earlier this year in the Lancet. Its series is on optimizing child and adolescent health and development. And my particular paper was on the effects of early life poverty on health and human capital uh, of children and adolescents. And I used two main data sets to analyze uh, these factors, which I'll describe to you shortly. Uh, the first uh, slide that I, I have on, on the underlying concept refers to the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, which have as their motto, uh, leave no one behind. That's a motto related to equity. And how interconnected the uh, different goals of health, education, nutrition, development, environment, uh, how interconnected they are among themselves. And also the concept of social determinants, the issue of social exclusion, the social gradient in health, which I'll show to you in, in several slides, and on the causes of the causes, that we're not only interested in the proximate causes uh, of ill health and poor development, we're also looking at what drives those causes. So we're looking at the distal determinants. Uh, I'll use two data sets. Uh, the first is an analysis of national surveys from 83 uh, low and middle income countries. These are part of the analysis that we routinely do at the International Center for Equity and Health here in Pelotas, Brazil. And the second set of analysis relate to human health and human capital uh, uh, related to analysis from uh, six long running birth cohort studies in low and middle income countries. Uh, we looked at several indicators. We're largely uh, dependent on data availability, but for children and adolescents, we looked at survival, linear growth, child development, achieved schooling, and teen uh, parenthood. And for adults, we looked at uh, several aspects of health, including, including psychological problems, metabolic syndrome, overweight, and obesity. We looked at height, at, uh, attained height in adulthood. And we also looked at intelligence and schooling as the intellectual dimension. So the first part of my talk will be on child and adolescent health, and it will be based on these uh, national surveys, uh, which are carried out routinely in many countries. Our database now in Pelotas here, uh, which is part of the Countdown to 2015 initiative, it has data from 117 countries, uh, over 400 surveys uh, covering uh, 4.2 million children. Uh, the darker countries here are the ones with the larger number of surveys, but you'll see that we have a, a very large proportion of low and in, in middle income countries that have uh, at least uh, one survey in our database. Uh, we then pull the data. We first uh, analyze data country by country, and then we pull these data across regions of the world uh, using uh, population weight. So a large country like India will have a much heavier uh, weight in the in the regional estimate than say Nepal or Sri Lanka. And then we divide the population, the households into deciles. That is 10 equal groups, each with 10% of all households in that sample. And, and the deciles are, are colored from brown, the wealthiest decile, to the, the dark green with the poorest decile. And here we have the results for under five mortality uh, based on these recent surveys uh, from, as I said, from uh, over 80 countries. In West and Central Africa, we have huge gaps. In all, all regions, you can see that the brown dots are moved more to the left, that is indicating lower mortality, than the green dots, indicating higher mortality. And the gaps are particularly wide in West and Central Africa. They're wide in South Asia and East Asia, the Pacific, and so on. But every region uh, has gaps. Uh, some, uh, the gaps are narrower than others, but it's incredibly consistent result that we have for under five mortality. A similar pattern comes up when we look at child stunting, that is low height for age in children under the age of five years. Uh, again, uh, huge gaps in those regions. 
Uh, take a look, for example, at Western Central Africa, where we have about 15% stunting in the richest uh, uh, decile and about 50% in the poorest. Also, South Asia has huge gaps, less than 20 to almost 60% uh, prevalence in the different groups. Even regions that are relatively more equitable also present gaps, as the case of uh, Middle East and North Africa, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and also to a lesser extent, Latin American Caribbean, where we find a pattern that we call a bottom uh, inequality or, or marginal exclusion, which is most of the population, most of the deciles have prevalence between five and 20%, and then the poorest decile, which are often indigenous population, remote rural populations, uh, African uh, Americans, they are at uh, much higher uh, rates of stunting. Same thing for development. We don't have data on the child development for so many countries, but there are, uh, these are based on a standardized child development questionnaire that is uh, developed by UNICEF and applied in the, in the mix surveys throughout the world. We also have huge gaps. And again, we see uh, a pattern that we, in this case, we call top inequality. That means the richest, the better off kids are well, uh, uh, they, they're much less likely to be uh, not on track for development, this is our indicator, than the children who are poor. So look at South Asia, for example, only 15% of children in the top decile of, of income are uh, of wealth are uh, not on track compared to almost half of the children in the poorest decile. So we're getting these same patterns for all the indicators we look into. This one is teenage motherhood. The girls under 20 who have uh, already delivered a baby, again, huge gaps in all regions of the world. Look at my part of the world here, Latin American, Caribbean, only 10% of girls uh, in, uh, have, have been a, a teen mother in the top decile uh, of wealth compared to over half in the poorest decile. So we're just seeing how these inequalities uh, persist and how they are reflected in different indicators. And the last one I have to show you here for this part of my talk is incomplete uh, primary school. And we're looking at kids where boys and girls were 15 to 19. And obviously you'll see some parts of the world like Eastern and Europe and Central Asia, or even Latin American Caribbean, uh, uh, where uh, virtually everybody completes primary school regardless of wealth. But then in South Asia, and in the three African regions, you see huge gaps here. Look at West Asia, uh, West and Central Africa, from less than, for about 5% to almost 50% gap in completion of primary school. And this, of course, uh, has an influence on their life course and on their children. And, and, and this is a topic we're looking at now in the second part of my talk. But to summarize the first part, uh, when we look at national surveys, uh, they are highly consistent uh, inverse associations between poverty and outcomes reflecting health and human capital. There are substantial gaps in their social gradients. That is not only the very poor who are uh, way behind. Well, sometimes they are, but there is a, a, a gradient which was first described very clearly by Michael Marmot, uh, showing that uh, as you move up the social ladder, uh, the social economic ladder, your outcomes get better. So just moving one decile or two deciles will already make a difference in terms of your health and human capital outcomes. We find that the widest gaps are in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia for most indicators, and the narrowest gaps tend to be in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, which are the uh, uh, earlier uh, Soviet uh, republics uh, that they are now uh, independent countries. Uh, the second part, is the one that uh, is more closely related to uh, the, the topic of Doha. It's a part of adult health and human capital, what we find in the long-term birth cohorts. And many of you will be aware with the cohorts consortium. Uh, we launched this in 2006 and our first paper came out in 2008 in another Lancet series on undernutrition. And the cohorts are from Guatemala. There are two cohorts from my hometown in Pilates, which I have started in 82 and 93. Uh, there's a Soweto cohort, the Birth to 20 study, the Delhi cohort, and the Cebu cohort in the Philippines. Uh, this slide is a, 
distorted the, the size of the countries, uh, the geographical area of the countries are proportional to the number of birth cohorts, the publications they had as, as of 2008. And we're now trying to get more publications coming out of the South to uh, address this imbalance in how much we know about life course in, in rich and in poor countries. Uh, the cohorts are quite different. Uh, they uh, were launched, uh, the earliest ones with Delhi and uh, the, the nutrition trial in Guatemala, which in this case, we do not analyze it as a trial, we do analyze it as a cohort, as a birth cohort. Uh, and they were started in 1969. The most recent one is the 1993 cohort in Pelotas. But all, everybody in these cohorts is aged uh, right now around 30 to, to 60 years. And there's a, one important issue here is that some cohorts include all social classes and uh, they're geographically defined and everybody who was born in geographic area is included. And that is mainly Pelotas and Cebu. And so, uh, but uh, other cohorts are more restricted. Uh, as you'll see in a later result, the cohort from Guatemala, they are all poor uh, families in four villages, even though we do see some uh, social gradients. The Delhi is mostly middle class and uh, birth to 20 is from Soweto, an uh, urban poor uh, black community. And we looked in these cohorts, we looked at the three indicators of, of uh, human capital, uh, schooling, IQ and height. And we also looked at some indicators of uh, NCDs and mental health. Uh, number one, we were not able to use uh, deciles here. This is because uh, we didn't have sufficient sample size to break down the cohorts, some of the cohorts at least, into 10 groups. So we're looking at quintiles. And the number two, what you see in this is that this is somewhat the reverse of the earlier uh, slides in which uh, the rich are better than the poor, are higher levels than the poor, because here we are looking uh, at positive attributes. Uh, in the first part of the slide, we're looking at mortality, stunting, uh, poor child development, so on. So the, the poor had higher values, higher prevalence in the rich, and now it's the opposite. So if we look at adult height uh, for men and women, we have separated these analysis by sex. Uh, and we see that, of course, in, in all cohorts, women are shorter than men. But in every one of these cohorts, there are uh, positive social gradients. So it is not so clear, but it's still it, it's it's still there. There it's a pretty homogeneous uh, group in Soweto. So we see that uh, your attained height in adulthood is is largely driven by poverty in childhood. Oh, I forgot to mention that in all of these analyses here, we're looking at early life poverty, uh, which was measured around the time of birth. Uh, we, and we're comparing that to outcomes that we have measured 20, 30, 40 years later. So it's on the persistent uh, effects of uh, early poverty. If we look at schooling in every cohort again, the rich have higher schooling than the poor, uh, huge differences mainly in Pelotas. Uh, some in Delhi, even though Delhi is a pretty homogeneous cohort, even in Guatemala, where, where, where the quintiles are not that different from each other, uh, in Soweto, we don't have much difference again because there's sort of a there, there is a compulsory universal secondary schooling and, and uh, in in that community. So again, uh, schooling reflects uh, how much you know, how much you learn, what kind of job you're going to get, and also how well you're going to be able to look after your kids. So it's a really really important indicator. With IQ, I was really impressed, and this is one of the the data that uh, most impressed me. Every cohort except for Delhi has IQ. In all of them, we have huge differences. In my own cohorts in Pelotas, these are for men and women. They're standardized with a, a mean of 100, uh, separately for, for men and women. And in Pelotas, we have an average IQ in, in women, for example, ranging from about 92, 93 to 112 by wealth quintile. Similar differences for men. Same in Guatemala, but less marked in Cebu as well. This is really, really important because this is how poverty perpetuates itself. It affects your brain development. As we saw in the results for kids, it affects your nutrition, it affects your earning ability, and that is, then it is transmitted intergenerationally. 
psychological symptoms, we did not get such a clear cut uh, uh, set of findings. Uh, we use the SRQ, a self-report questionnaire, a mental health screening questionnaire with 20 points. And here we have the average in each quintile. We see pretty large differences in Pelopas, for example, uh, but we don't see very consistent pattern. In Guatemala, if anything, the better off had higher uh, uh, number of symptoms than the poor, same in Cebu. So there, it was a bit of a mixed bag here. Unlike everything else we've seen so far, the social gradients uh, varied from one cohort to another. Overweight obesity, again, another mixed bag. And look at Pelotas. We're having this pattern here that's emerging in Brazil. The rich men uh, have a uh, higher prevalence of, of, of overweight and obesity than the poor men, likely due to uh, less physical activity and, and into, uh, they, they're not involved in manual work. And for women, we're getting uh, the reverse trend here. In other cohorts, in Cebu, we still have the sort of a, the early nutrition transition pattern in which rich men and rich women tend to be uh, more affected by overweight than the poor. And it's, it's some cohorts, it's all over the place. Uh, so we don't have such a clear cut pattern. Uh, there is clearly uh, some uh, early determination here, at least in Pelotas and in Cebu. But uh, in Pelotas, it's sex specific as others have described previously. And finally, uh, metabolic signs, again, a bit of a mixed bag. Again, in Pelotas, the, the better off women have fewer metabolic signs. These are five signs that are part of the metabolic syndrome uh, uh, classification, uh, five different signs. And here, how many, uh, the average number of signs they have. So it was a similar thing too, the better off are the women are thinner. Again, here in Guatemala, but not much of a pattern elsewhere. So again, a bit of a mixed bag. I'm gonna summarize the cohorts because I still have a couple of minutes left. Uh, all significant results uh, for human capital uh, were associated with early poverty, mainly shorter height, lower IQ and schooling. And there is strong evidence for the social gradient in health for height, IQ, and schooling. Very clear, uh, as we saw in the child data. The results for overweight obesity uh, and metabolic syndrome, psychological symptoms, were complex. They really reflect uh, changes, nutrition transition, uh, epidemiological transition. These cohorts are the different uh, phases of the, these transitions, and also the intersectionality of uh, early poverty and uh, sex of, of the cohort members. So women having one type of pattern in some cohorts and men having uh, the opposite pattern with richer men tending to have a uh, higher prevalence of overweight and, uh, and richer women tending to have lower prevalence of underweight. And the strongest associations are in Pilotas where health, uh, wealth inequality is, is widest. Now, just for you to have an idea, the, the income ratio between the top quintile and the bottom quintile below this is about 11 fold. So it's a huge difference in wealth. Uh, rich, rich kids in rich households were brought with 10, 11 times more money than kids in the poorest quintile. Uh, now, placing these in the global context, uh, what was happening uh, up to around uh, 2015, 2018, was that poverty was being reduced, mostly in South, South Asia, East Asia, Latin America, not so much in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the number of poor people remained stable. But then we had the COVID pandemic, and that drove uh, estimates. Uh, we estimate uh, half a billion people into poverty. So we're really facing a renewed challenge now uh, with uh, re recovery from the COVID, which is actually, by the way, is obviously still ongoing. Summing up, our survey analysis showed that the importance of early poverty in for child and adolescent outcomes. The birth cohort analysis showed that the importance of early poverty is, is, is long lasting. So it also remains in terms of most adult outcomes we have studied. Because today's children will become tomorrow's adults, we, we can expect this next generation that's now uh, growing up to also show the long-term effect of poverty. 
and uh, in in therefore uh, present day inequalities will definitely affect health and human capital in the next decades. Uh, <clears throat> summing up, this is a Doha uh, meeting. A lot of the literature uh, on on child and adolescent health and on life course analysis has focused on proximate determinants, uh, such as a uh, uh, low birth weight or infections or nutritional state of childhood and on biomedical interventions. These interventions are, uh, are really, really important. There's no question about that. Uh, so increasing coverage with these interventions is essential. However, uh, the, the social determination of, of health and human capital along the life course uh, also means that we need a broader anti-poverty and multi-sectoral agendas to complement and amplify the benefits of these biomedical, uh, specific biomedical interventions. And these include things like conditional cash transfers, minimum wage, child benefits, and so on. And finally, action is even more urgent in face of the pandemic. Thank you very much. I now uh, would like to thank all my colleagues who were involved in this study. And, and if you're interested, please uh, uh, download the Lancet paper. It's open access. And we'll be happy uh, if, you, if you actually look at our results and, and incorporate them in, in, in your studies. Thank you very much.